So welcome everyone to our September webinar. Today we have David Anderson and his topics today is no prioritization. So he's going to be talking about filtering available options and triaging demand with caveat charts. So David, whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Lauren. So uh, we're coming to you today from our training center in Bilbao in Spain. And um, Lauren and I are sitting different offices here. This, And as Lauren was saying, there's, there's a guy playing the accordion outside our window. So if that does pick up on the audio, uh, we apologize, but hopefully it doesn't affect the presentation. Now, some of you may have seen this material before. Hopefully most of you are new to it, uh, but it's not new material for us. It's stuff that we've had and been teaching for many years already now. It's mostly bundled into our enterprise services planning training and our new Kanban product professional training. It's been included in other training curricula over the years. And I've used this material in keynote speeches at, at different times. So it's um, good to revisit material that, that many new to, new to Kanban or new to our other teachings, enterprise services planning or fit for purpose, pre, fit for purpose framework um, may not have seen before. So the uh, People will often ask, how do you do planning, prioritization um, in Kanban or for a Kanban system? And the, the trite answer is there's no prioritization. We're going to explain what we do instead and why that's a more elegant solution. Um, if I could get it to change slides, let's see what happened. There it is. Okay, so first of all, people use this term prioritization a lot. Do, do, do you actually know what you mean by it? And can you write a definition for it? Um, we find that when people say something's priority, uh, that it's usually just an expression of how they feel about it. It might be its urgency or its importance or that they think it should happen before something else. It's its position in a sequence. And therefore, the fact that something's priority isn't necessarily actionable, especially if everything is priority. And priority or prioritization, priority can mean what's our number one thing? What should we do first? Uh, priorities might imply a sequence. We do something first, then second, then third, then fourth. Um, and prioritization is the act of determining this sequence. And we find that people can mean by some, if something being priority, it's the sequence we do something in, or it could be the schedule. When, when should we do it? It could be the selection of should we pick it? You know, what's number one? Which thing should we pick right now? Or it could be its class of service. If you send a letter in the old fashioned mail and you buy the, the first class stamp or the airmail stamp, it will say on the, the envelope, it's priority mail. And that's the class of service that your letter is receiving. So priority and prioritization are ambiguous terms and people use them in different ways to mean different things at different times and our preference is that we don't use ambiguous language we prefer that you if you mean the sequence something should be done you call it sequencing if you mean when something should be started you call it scheduling if you mean choosing something out of a selection of available choices that's selection and if you mean how should something be treated once we start working on it, that's its class of service. So priority and prioritization can mean many things. And we have specific solutions for each of these four different types of things that people use these words for. All right, so the priority of something, uh, how it's selected, let me let me get rid of that. Um, how is it treated? What order should it be done in? 
or when should it be started? It, you know, it's, it, when we're scheduling it, and that tends to be based on its urgency and its cost of delay. If we delay it, if we start it today or we delay it by a week, what's the impact of that? If we delay it by a month, what's the impact of that? And relative to other things, if we can only do one thing right now, which one should we choose? And if other things get delayed for a while, what's the impact of that delay? So we need to be able to answer these questions to adequately prioritize something. All right, so here's our little cartoon character guy, and he's just repeating the, 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 the point here that priority is sequencing or scheduling or selection or class of service. And we have tools to help with that. Uh, the, the challenge with a large set of choices, if you have a large backlog, hundreds, perhaps thousands of things, should you spend any time sequencing? You know, people talk about prioritizing the backlog. Well, say you have 2,000 things in your backlog, should you sequence those 2,000 into one, two, three, four? right through to uh, 1,997, 98, 99, 2000. That doesn't seem like a very good use of time. Um, very large backlogs, they, they created this term in Agile, backlog grooming, spending time, keeping the backlog clean, clean and tidy, keeping it well prioritized. And that just seems like busy work for someone. It's not really adding any value. And it has to be done frequently because new, new requests are arriving. The backlog's getting bigger. When actually we want to be able to make decisions for questions like, what should we start next? If we have 2,000 things to choose from, which of those should be started next? Which order should we do them in? Should some things happen in parallel? Do they have to happen in sequence? Does something have to preempt something else? Um, therefore, there's a particular sequence. There's some dependency in that sequence. Um, and what's the impact if something takes longer than we hoped for? What does that do to everything else? And really, do we need to repeatedly stack rank things? And honestly, we think you don't. That traditional approaches to prioritization are cumbersome, time consuming, often involve a lot of guesswork. Um, there are layers and layers of assumptions, and the, uh, the, there's a lot of ambiguity that what did we really mean by priority? So, the answer is to stop prioritizing and instead filter things. If you were, uh, and this screenshot in the background here is from, um, from Google's travel facility. And if you go to a travel website and perhaps you're trying to book a, a flight before, before the pandemic happened, and you type in maybe the day you want to fly, the airport you want to leave from, the city you want to go to, and you press search, it might come back with three or 4,000 suggestions for how you get from, in this instance, Hamburg to Bilbao. Well, how do you choose the flight you're actually going to book from three or 4,000 suggestions? You don't prioritize them. You don't sequence them. Um, you filter them and travel websites have lots and lots of filters to narrow down a very large set of search results to a small human manageable list. You can search by how long the flight takes, whether it has connections or not, what, what's the time of departure or what's the time of arrival. You can uh, filter by, by price. You can set upper and lower thresholds on the price. You can filter by the class of services, an economy class ticket or a business class ticket, and so on. And by setting a series of filters, you can reduce a 3,500 uh, set of search results down to perhaps 20. And now you can scroll through those 20 and you can start picking 
the, the one that makes the most sense, that if you can get it down to perhaps one page of results, it becomes a human manageable problem. Pick one from 20, not pick one from three and a half thousand. You got from three and a half thousand to 20 by filtering, not by prioritizing, not by sequencing in some way, not by stack ranking things. That, that's possible, but it would be incredibly time consuming and wasteful. You wouldn't do it in your real life. Why would you do it at the office? So the filtering has to incorporate risk-based thinking that um, we need to recognize there's more than one possibility that our measurements tend to have uncertainty. There are sets of probabilities and possibilities. There are ranges. We can't be precise. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't tell the future in advance. And some possibilities result in a loss or an undesired outcome. From time to time, we're going to choose something and it turned out to be a bad idea. It's inevitable. We have to recognize that we, we need some tolerance to that. We need some tolerance to recognize we can't get it right all the time. We can't choose the best thing at the best time every single time. What we're looking to achieve is a good set of selections, items selected and scheduled or sequenced in a relatively good order that produces a desirable business outcome. Um, so we don't prioritize, we want the backlog left entirely unsorted. And we want to select dynamically. If you have your Kanban system, Kanban replenishment meeting, maybe two or three Kanban free, two or three slots free in the in your input buffer, your replenishment meeting question is which two, or if there are three, which three uh, should we pick to start now? So we want to decide now and everything else is going to wait until later. In some cases, some things aren't going to be done at all. So there's now, there's later, and, and if later, when, next, next replenishment meeting, sometime in the future, we're not really sure, it's not that urgent. Or, you know, this isn't really very valuable. Why are we doing it at all? And that concept of putting things in three buckets of now, later, and not at all, that's known as triage. We want to do that at the replenishment meeting using a raw, unsorted backlog. We have not wasted a single ounce of energy or time on this backlog until we filter it at the replenishment meeting and make some selections. Now, one of the key ways to filter is to decide what things do we have that are urgent or that ideally need to be started today at today's replenishment meeting or in the very near future. And for well over a decade now, 13, 13, 14 years, we've had a system in Kanban for assigning four classes of service based on the urgency or the cost of delay of an item. And while the class of service tells us how the, the ticket should be treated, how the work item should be treated as it flows through our board, through our workflow, it also tells us its urgency because the urgency relates to its treatment. If it's an expedite request, it jumps all the queues and it, it takes priorities, it moves across the board, that it will always get picked. People will block other work in order to work on the expedite request. Where a ticket with a fixed delivery date, we can pace the flow of the ticket with the intent of delivering it just in time. So before it's needed, but not too early. Standard class tickets, we recognize we want nice, smooth, steady flow. And earlier would be good, but later doesn't kill us. Then our intangible class of service tickets. They are things which are not immediately urgent, but if we don't get them done, they will eventually bite us. 
we've had this guidance since 2007. And in the format that I'm showing here, um, I first developed this in 2009, and it appeared with the Kanban book in 2010. So already more than 11 years ago. More recently, we realized that people struggle to put uh, a quantitative un you know, understanding or to have some certainty that they've picked the right class of service, that they were simply using their gut feeling. Yes, this has a hard delivery date, must be fixed date, or yes, this seems really urgent, it should be expedite. But how do we choose between standard and intangible? We realized a lot of people needed help with that. So we developed something called the, the triage tables and we created a poster that you can download from movisoft.com slash download. And this poster walks you through a seven uh, stage uh, mechanism for determining the correct class of service for an item. Um, this uh, shows you the workflow, but I'm going to to walk you uh, through it. First of all, we have to make some choice about after the item is delivered, how does it provide value? How does it make us money or contribute in some way over the period of time from delivery to whenever it expires in the future? And uh, a typical product life cycle, you launch a product, you don't make a lot of money, gradually you make more and more money, and then eventually it tails off. And it's a classic bell curve type of a, a life cycle value curve. And we've provided a map of, of 11 different ones to choose from. So you choose the one that's closest, the best fit, that has the best match to, to the item you're holding. And then you ask the question, how long is the life cycle? Perhaps we launch a product and it, it gives us value for five years. And if it took us up to one year to make that product, then it, it had a one year lead time and it had a five year payoff. And that ratio, that shelf life ratio of one to five means that's relatively long, the payoff is long in comparison to the length of time we spent making it. So we select the shelf life ratio. And then we look up the triage table that the uh, life cycle value functions are on the rows and the shelf life ratios are on the columns. And if we had something that was a, a long shelf life and it was a bell curve with um, with no first mover advantage, then we look at that and we say, okay, this is a standard class of service item. It doesn't need any special treatment. However, there are one or two other things we might want to consider. We might want to consider how, how early we're starting in comparison to when we would like to launch. Most companies have some concept of we like to launch products at a certain time of year, in the spring or in the autumn, or just in time for a particular holiday, the Christmas holidays perhaps, or, or Easter holidays. So how far in advance of that are we? And how does that compare to our lead time probability distribution curve? In other words, how comfortable are we that we can deliver the item on or before we would ideally like to have it? And we have start date ranges. The normal range here is we have an 85% or better chance of on-time delivery. Anything better than that we refer to as early or super early. If we've less than an 80% chance, it's either late or irresponsibly late. And we can use that information to modify the class of service. If we are late starting something, we probably need to give it more urgency. And to simplify uh, what is actually really quite complicated mathematics, we want you just simply to take a look at your lead time distribution curve and determine whether it's thin-tailed or fat-tailed. 
and we've provided a shorthand way of doing this, which has some mathematical validity based on the fact that we know that that from the evidence collected over many years, these lead time distribution curves tend to follow variations of what's known as the Weibull distribution. And because of that, there are some mathematical ratios which help us determine whether something is thin or fat tailed, whether it's super or sub exponential in nature. And the, the whole concept of fat tail, that's the thing on the right hand side here with the long tail extending, is fat tailed lead time means there is a risk, a significant risk that you'll be late. And if you are late, the impact could be very high, that the delay could be significant before, before you're late. With the thin tailed distribution, there's still some risk you might be late. But if you are late, it's probably only by a few days. So the impact is a lot smaller, even if you're late. And that's enough for us to say, well, you know, we're, if we're a thin-tailed lead time, we're a little bit late, probably doesn't kill us, particularly for a long shelf life ratio item. It's definitely not going to kill us. But if we've got a fat-tailed lead time distribution, if we think something might take anything from 30 to 100 days, we should probably double that and think it's going to be 200. And we've built that concept into the triage tables as a modifier. So we can look at our lead time distribution, say if we're thin tailed, when we look up these modifier tables. Then we also ask ourselves, how tolerant is our customer or the customer's trusting and tolerant and the nature of the work is such that um, they, they, they'll not die if things take a little bit longer. Nobody dies. Nobody gets fired. On the other hand, perhaps the customer really doesn't trust us and they use deadlines as some way of pressurizing us to deliver and we need to build a trust relationship with them. So we want to deliver on time and that creates additional risk. So we separate out where the customer trusts us and is willing to work within a service level agreement or service level expectation versus not trusting us and is setting a deadline that we have to hit. And that gives us two different sets of modifiers. And we can do that for thin tailed or fat tailed and the modifier table tells us how to move the position. So if we go back to our original triage table, our bell curve with no first mover advantage on a long shelf life, that was a standard class of service. But if the, if the customer didn't trust us and we were fat tailed, um, and we were starting, say, within a normal range that we believe that we can finish this product within the one year product development cycle and launch it on time. Uh, we have to treat it as a fixed date item, not a standard item. And that happens for two reasons. Because we have a fat tailed lead time, we're historically unpredictable and our customer doesn't trust us. So it should be a standard class of service item but we are unpredictable and our customer doesn't trust us. Therefore, it must be a fixed date item. So we've built all of this logic into a handy little mobile app for, for iPhone and uh, Android. And you can download that. I think we support more than these languages already. I think um, we also have Russian and Portuguese supported. So you can uh, download the app and just the, the app prompts you with five questions and then it, it's like a pocket calculator. It tells you the class of service to use for the item. Now, why this is important is it's one way of filtering. We might have set capacity allocation for a certain quantity of intangible class of service items because it's good to have a few items that aren't urgent just in case an expedite request arrives and we have to block something. So 
let's filter the backlog based on intangible class of service. Show me all the items that, that have the intangible class of service out of our, say, 3,500 backlog. That's the first layer of filtering. And then we start using other layers of filtering. Now, to do that, we really need to understand what does this word value mean? Everyone talks about value. Agile development's about delivering value. And just like prioritization, people are not very good at defining what they mean by value. Value is a very complex concept. It's not just money. And in many cases, it's not money at all. Imagine a scenario where you work in the IT department of a, a large corporation and you maintain an internal security application that issues the physical security badges for the employees. And the company's opening a new office in a new city. And we've been recruiting new workers who are going to come to that office and work. And they've all been issued security badges or they need to be issued security badges so they can enter the building when the office opens and they're available to come to work. And what's the dollar value or the euro value of that? It's almost impossible to put a value on it. On the other hand, if we're late delivering it, employees can't come to work. So there is value, but it's not measured as money. And to get our head around what value is, we need to build a much more um, nuanced model that's multidimensional. And we do that with a risk profile. And multidimensional risk profiles can be mapped out using these spider chart like, like graphs known as caveat charts. And Professor Kvyat, uh, he introduced this technique for use on uh, American federal government projects uh, 20, more than 20 years ago, 30, maybe 30 years ago. And I borrowed this technique from something I learned from famous software engineering guru, um, uh, Barry Bame, Professor Barry Bame uh, of uh, uh, University of Southern California. And who, Barry does a lot of work with federal government in the USA, so he's very familiar with, with the use of this technique. And each risk gets its own dimension. Right? So what we're looking at here is a risk framework. There are five risks, five risk dimensions in the framework. And then if we map the score for a particular item so that we get a shape, um, the, the shape represents the risk profile. So here's an example of a risk dimension that the role that a feature in a product plays in the market. It could be table stakes. No one will buy this unless it has this feature. It could be a cost reducing feature. We put this feature into the product in order to make it easier to make, easier to maintain, um, you know, e easier to deliver to the customer, whatever it might be, some way that saves us money, improves our profit margin perhaps, or allows, allows us to reduce the cost. Or it could be a feature we've added in order to copy a competitor's feature. We're, trying, we're playing catch up, we're trying to neutralize a competitive advantage. And when I worked at a telephone company called Sprint, we used to refer to those as spoilers. We were spoiling the competition's advantage. Or it could be something unique, very new, and therefore it's differentiating. So there's four market roles. And why we like these sort of taxonomies is you can establish them as a fact. It's not opinion, it's not speculation, it's not crystal ball gazing. Is something a must have feature and people will not buy it if it's not included? Yes or no? If yes, it's table stakes. Is this feature there in order to save us money or save our distribution channel money, save our service engineers money, something like that? Say you know, reduce the lifetime cost of this product, then it's a cost reducer. 
does it already exist, but it's not table stakes and we're copying a competitor's idea? Then it's a spoiler. And if it's none of those, then it must be new and unique and it's a differentiator. Typically, it takes about 20 seconds for a room of people to form a consensus because these things are facts. They're not speculation. It's not estimation we're doing here. It's analysis of fact. So this is a risk dimension. It has a taxonomy. In this case, it has four categories. And our target is to establish a risk framework, perhaps for a whole Kanban board, but definitely for a work item type, for a specific type of work that we process, we should develop a risk framework. And the risk framework describes different ways that that particular feature or function will add value and how that value might be affected. And th this is an example of a framework with five dimensions. We have the market role, we have technical risk, whether we know how to do it or not, how easy it is to get it done. Uh, we have cost of delay impact separated into urgency and the, the magnitude of the impact if we are late. And then we have the position in the product life cycle. Is this a new product that uh, appeals to enthusiasts? Or is it an old product that's very late in its life cycle and we understand it really well? Those things all represent business opportunity and risk and tell us information about if we're a little bit late with this, will people care? Or if it's got a few bugs in it, will people care? Or is there a chance we can't even deliver it because we don't know how to do it uh, and so forth? So each work item type would get its own unique risk framework. This is just an example. And then for a specific type, we can map its profile. And we use these risk profiles to filter down so that we only have a small set of items left to choose from and make a selection. Skip past this, a little bit too much detail here, a little bit, a little more detail on the, the, the market role risk category. If something's table stakes, why, why would we build it at all? Maybe rent it as software as a service, um, buy it as commercially off the shelf or outsource it. And it doesn't need to be done in an agile way. It could be very slow. It's, it could take a long time, but we know we must have it before we can launch. We can start it early. On the other hand, something that's differentiating is risky. And perhaps we have to learn more about it. Perhaps we have to run some experiments, some sort of lean startup type experimentation before we make a final commitment to a specification. And we should build it as rapidly as possible. So defer commitment and then build as rapidly as possible because if it's differentiating and there's an advantage, we want to take advantage of that before someone else. Then regulatory requirements, a special case of table stakes. The reason here is that, yes, regulatory requirements are essential, but the regulator changes the rules from time to time, and the regulatory requirements have to be modified and the system updated in order to keep up with the regulations. Therefore, they go through cycles of being more risky and less risky. Then. How long, say something's a differentiator, how long do we think it's differentiating? How long do we have before our competitor copies it? Is it rapid, less than one product cycle, less than one release cycle? Is it fast, just one, medium, two to four cycles or slow, you know, five or more cycles? And if we have some barrier to entry, like um, secret recipe, or patents, or we happen to have all the scientists in the world that 
in the early days of Kanban, we worked with a company called Posit Science. And at one point, they had about 50% of the world's brain plasticity scientists. So the chance that someone could copy their work was very low because there was a shortage of brain plasticity neuroscientists. So if you have a high barrier to entry, the chances are that people can't copy what you're doing for a long time. Therefore, it's less urgent. The cost of delay is lower. So we can decide later, we can do things at a slower pace, or if we have a rapid depreciation in our advantage, we need to move quickly, decide early, move very quickly. So risk assessment frameworks are the key. When a new item enters the backlog, it should be analyzed very quickly for each of the risk categories. They're all fact-based. This shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes that facts should be entered. They don't change because they're facts. The item could stay in our backlog for one or two years and it doesn't need groomed because the, the information doesn't change. The facts about it don't change. So the data stays in there and this enables us to filter using uh, these. Now, developing the risk framework is a, a case of developing a custom risk framework, one for each work item type. We don't issue a cookie cutter version of this that works for everyone because your context, your business, your business risks are different from ours or someone else's. This is an example from Me Dreams or Digio. It's written in Spanish. Many Europeans here will know that eDreams or Digio is a travel company um, similar to Expedia, based primarily in Barcelona, but other offices around Europe. And this was an example of one they developed in 2015. And it, it has um, things like, do we have the skill? Do we know how to do this? Um, how long is it going to take us to bring it to market? How well aligned is it with our strategic objectives, the, the OKRs? Um, how many clients are impacted? Everyone who uses our website, only the professional users, um, some other stakeholders, that kind of thing. Um, what's the basic um, uh, value to the client? You know, they, in this case, they're using um, Cano analysis to figure that out. And then um, the, uh, the technical risk, you know, how do we know how to do it or not? And those are mapped on there. So this was an example of a real one from about six years ago. Now, selection and sequencing, if we have that information, how do we use it? Well, we can create a demand shaping threshold or, or a triage threshold. We can take a look at each of the taxonomies and we can say, which category do we care about or a category and other more risky categories we care about, other less risky ones we don't. And we set that for each dimension. And that gives us a demand shaping threshold, a triage threshold. Now imagine that this blue one is the risk profile for an item in our backlog. It's outside the threshold, therefore we should do it. This one on the other hand, this other ticket, different profile, it's inside the threshold and therefore we shouldn't do it. And this one spans the threshold, so we need to talk about it. Now, these shapes, these, these risk profiles are communicating the value. So they're communicating, should we do it or should we not do it? And if we should do it, then there's a separate question about when. Should it be now or a bit later? And if later, when? So we use the risk profile and filtering based on a demand shaping threshold to decide, do it or don't do it. Yes or no. And then we use the cost of delay, the triage tables to determine is it now or is it later? And if so, when? So it's a two step process in order to make a selection of something.
Now, we could use this mechanism either as internal or external exclusion. You can either uh, select low risk items or you can select the high risk items. And whether you're doing high or low risk will depend on your own particular business circumstances. So this just reverses the result. You know, we wouldn't do the blue one, we would do the orange one, uh, and this other orange one, we would, we would talk about it. And we can get uh, more clever. We can add two, two layers of threshold. Now, the uh, risk expert, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, talks about barbell strategy. Barbell strategy, the idea of you do a few very high risk things, you do a lot of low risk things to hedge the high risk and stuff that's kind of medium risk, you don't do it. And if we use two, thresholds that enables us to detect um, mid, we want mid band exclusion here right so something to the outside is high risk so maybe we want to do that and things to the inside are low risk and we want them to balance the balance in the barbell anything that's in the middle in the donut is middle risk and we wouldn't do it and then things that span the risk profile, maybe we have to talk about them. So something that's completely inside the donut, we don't do it. We can use this as a filtering technique by playing around with where the thresholds go, we can filter down what might be thousands of things to a human manageable um, discussion. So, I have a slide that illustrates that. I am going to skip over this. Well, maybe not. Um, so the, the these risk profiles can inform sequencing decisions that we might, for example, want to start low risk items early and defer high risk items until later. Or we might want to start high risk items early in order to solve technical risk. Now, if risk profiles looked like this, then it's easy to sequence. It's either the blue one, the orange one, and the green one. If we're going for the high risk items first or the other way around, it's green, orange, blue. However, in real life, it's just not this simple. It, it doesn't work. This is an example from real life. This is from a company called Bazaar Voice from a workshop in a class perhaps about eight years ago. And now it's not so obvious. Now, in this particular example, the blue shape came from a brand new idea that one of the senior executives had come up with on the weekend, arrived in the office full of enthusiasm with, I've had a brilliant idea and we should do it immediately. Well, actually those are just two simple questions. Is it a brilliant idea? And if it is, should we do it immediately? So let's answer question one, is it a brilliant idea? That's the should we do it or not? And we map it onto their risk profile and we see that it's it's pretty urgent. It has a high cost of delay. It's worth a lot of money. It um, is highly differentiating. No one else is doing it. We know how to do it from a technical risk perspective. Um, it affects a significant part of our user base, but not everyone. And it has no legal risks. There's no chance we're going to get sued or create a class action lawsuit or breach a contract with a client. So it's low legal risk. It's worth a lot of money. It's very urgent. We know how to do it and no one else is doing it. It's a brilliant idea. And it's urgent, so we should do it now. But you know, everybody's busy. We're all working on these other projects. So if we're going to do the blue one, which one of the other three should we put aside for the time being? 
And that's not immediately obvious. You have to talk about it for a few minutes, perhaps. But if we look carefully, the purple one is a little different. It is table stakes for a particular market, but looking closely, it's for a market niche or a single client. And it turned out it was for a single client. Um, it's not actually worth a lot of money and it's got a low cost of delay. So delaying the purple project doesn't hurt us very much. And it involves one of our business development people having an uncomfortable conversation with a single client to tell them that something we promised them is being delayed. Within 20 minutes, everyone leaves the meeting understanding why we've decided to take the senior executive's brilliant idea and do it immediately, and why we've decided to suspend the purple project until the blue project is completed. There is a consensus. Everything was based on fact rather than speculation. It wasn't a heated and stressful conversation. It's easy to get to these results very quickly. And some of you might be wondering, is there software to help with this? And the answer is yes, the Swift Kanban ESP edition for many years now has already had this feature. You can build these multi-dimensional risk frameworks. You can create a risk profile for each item in the backlog. You can filter the backlog down to a manageable set that can be chosen in a human way. You can set your demand shaping threshold and you can uh, uh, tell it you want internal or external exclusion. And then it will sort the items on the screen showing you the ones that match all the criteria. It will sort them by match all, in this case, all six matches all six criteria. So definitely do it. Then five out of six, four out of six, and so on. And that allows you to look at how many are in each category. If we're doing a product release and we've got an idea, a rough idea of how many features we might complete in that product during that release, say it's 100, well, we can scroll down on list until we reach the 100 point. Now, maybe six out of six, then five out of six, we get into the four out of six, and it now spans 100. We're including all the four out of six, we're at 110. That's too many. But now we need to decide which 10 of the four out of six do we not do in this release and postpone to the next release. And we can answer that by looking at the cost of delay for the items that meet four out of six of the criteria. So what could be a, a hugely difficult prioritization exercise can be done in this level of complexity with hundreds or thousands of items in your backlog, maybe a half an hour, maybe one hour. And you leave with a product release plan that everyone agrees on with a, a defensible set of risk criteria for why you chose the items you did. Most of it was done automatically by filtering and only the things on the margin involved a conversation. Now, in a webinar like this, I can only give you a flavor for it. If you want to learn to do this properly, we teach it in our new Kanban product professional classes. The KPP1 class, identifying and defining value. So how do you write requirements for things? How do you create the risk profiles? How do you understand what, what value actually means? And then the second class, maximizing the value delivery, how do you ensure that you're selecting the right items at the right time, that you're sequencing things in the right order, that you're giving items the correct class of service when they enter your Kanban system for delivery? 
Uh, in other words, really, really smart product management. And now available in two two-day classes delivered online as four half days each. And our new Kanban product professional credential as a, as a result of completing these classes uh, issued by Kanban University. All right, so benefits of the credential, you've learned how to assess business value in a really intelligent, multi-dimensional, very nuanced way. You'll know how to write clearer, more relevant requirements and learn how to use the fit for purpose framework to help facilitate better requirements that are really focused on user needs and, and the purpose that people come to you to do business. And ultimately, that leads to better economic outcomes um, for your business. And hopefully everyone appreciates you so much more as a product manager. Um, to learn more, uh, we're offering these classes in November and February. And the simplest way is to visit our website, djaa.com, or email the info at djaa.com. Most likely, Lauren will be the one replying to you. And there are 20% uh, discounts available for registering early. And if you're in a country like Brazil, we adjust the prices using our purchasing power parity uh, price adjustment formula to make our classes as affordable as possible for people from economies that uh, where the currency isn't worth as much as Europe or North America. And with that, thank you very much. Hopefully we have a little time for questions. Okay, thanks, David. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box down below. Um, all right, we got one in. So David, are the dimensions fixed um, by the dimensions he's referring to their names and their quantity? No, we teach you how to design those. Everything should be custom and done in your own context. That certainly we have commonly recurring ones which are relatively universal in, the, in their application. Um, and the, the class contains a catalog of those. But I can tell you from experience that I, I, I did this as workshops for eDreams or Digio, for example, in 2015. And they left the class, in fact, the very night they left the class, they, they'd made their own profiles during the class. They put them in immediate use and after class, they went to a meeting with the chief executive and some consultants, some business strategy consultants who were there at the same time. And it was instantly effective. Now, they did that using all of the, let's say, catalog templates that I provide in the training class. One year later, the risk profile that their airline ticket solutions group was using no longer contained anything that was presented in class. So they started out with perhaps six of the dimensions from the class. So picked them from a catalog and thought, yeah, that would be useful. Then they started adding their own custom ones and eventually they got to a framework with 10. And I, I remember saying in class that I'd never seen a real one with 10 dimensions. That's probably too many. So that, that acted as a, as a catalyst for them. Oh, we've got too many. Well, David said we should never have 10. Which ones are we not really using? They started to study, do we use this dimension to make decisions or not? And if not, then we take it out. And they went from six to 10. And by the end of the year, they had shrunk it down to only four. And those four were new, unique, custom developed on site. So yes, we can teach you to be the grand designer and come up with your own custom framework straight off the bat, but actually an evolutionary approach is probably better. Start with some of the templates we provide that we found useful over the years in different businesses, pick some that are meaningful for you, start with that, and then evolve, add your own, modify the, 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 the standard ones that we've provided, um, 
but yeah, there, 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 there isn't a prescription here. Your business risks are different from ours. Okay, thanks. Um, so I saw this one in the chat earlier. So what appears to be missing on the risk graph is the value realization side of the equation. In the example you gave, there was no visualization of the value side and the team had to have conversation about the fact that one of the ideas was for a single customer. Is there a way to visualize the value side? I think that was in the triage tables. All right, so the, the, the value life cycle and how value appears over time, that's in the triage tables. So both of these are taken care of. Okay, and regarding market role and life cycle, how do we avoid uh, the, we know what our customers want trap? I, I'm not sure I know that. Uh, so the, the idea of, uh, when I worked at Microsoft and developer tools, they're like, we're all developers. so we know what we want and all other developers should be should be the same. Um, the, the issue there is really understanding the customer's purpose. We solved that with the fit for purpose framework. It, it wasn't presented in this webinar. Um, so understanding market segments by purpose and what the fitness criteria are for a specific market segment um, and recognizing that not everyone is like you. However, that requires a certain level of empathy and a certain level of both personal and organizational maturity. So the fit for purpose framework is the way that we we avoid the, the trap of thinking, the, the arrogance of thinking that we know what the market needs. I think also feedback loops work really well to help with that. That again, when I worked at Microsoft, uh, we used to send people out, teams of people to do field research and bring them back, bring back the field research. And we'd have these uh, lunch and learn meetings in one of the cinemas or sort of lecture halls inside the campus. A few hundred people all sitting there with sandwiches, watching the, the presentation and the video they'd made from the, the clients demonstrating to these Microsoft developers that people working in, say, an insurance company's IT department were indeed not like them. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick one. Yeah, so the, the, so the, the repeat here is that it was referring to the Bizarre Voice caveat chart. Well, you know, it's really a question for Bizarre Voice, but I think you're completely missing the concept there will never be a dimension called value. The entire chart represents the value. And actually there was a dimension that talked about the, the financial impact. Okay, um, so one more quick one. Is there a spreadsheet version of the tool? Um, so do we have any? I, I have examples. met people over the years who created their own spreadsheet version, and it's a really good idea, but we don't have one publicly available. Okay, great. So we are out of time, so we'll have to end it there. But as always, we encourage you to send in any of your questions that didn't get answered during the live session. Um, I'll work with David to make sure you guys all get an answer. So just email them to us either at the info email or support at DJA.com. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, David. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Appreciate you being here.